Heavenly Father, um, it is you we have come to see. And so we just ask that you would bless the preaching of your word to give us exactly what we need. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. What do you know about wrestling? I don't know where your mind goes. I was a kid of the 80s, and so whenever someone brings up wrestling, I, I can't help but think of this guy, famous for ripping an already torn t-shirt, Hulk Hogan, right? I, I love um, Andre the Giant. Um, I love the characters of Jake the Snake, and I recognize that uh, today there are different characters. You might know Dwayne the Rock Johnson, if you're a young kid. Uh, you might know John Cena. That's some wrestling. But maybe you've never watched WWF or WWE. Uh, maybe for you, all wrestling has to do with is uh, with your um, parents when you were growing up. And you had a dad, or you had an uncle, or you had a sibling, and you guys knew what it was to wrestle. I don't know if they were nice to you about that or not, if they pinned you or not. Um, that's wrestling. For me, in high school, um, I did the sport of wrestling. Which, by the way, for all you, do you know you can't play wrestling? Do you, it's not even a phrase. You can't play wrestle. You just wrestle. Like, it's a, it's a tough sport in spandex. Anyway. Um, and, um, and so, uh, I don't know what your, your connotation with wrestling is, uh, whether it's WWF, WWE, uh, you know, with siblings, parents. But even if you never thought of it before and don't want to think about it, I have something to tell you. Spiritually speaking, you're in a wrestling match. And, and you're in a wrestling match every day that you live. In fact, I want to welcome you if you are new to Christianity, you're new in this place, you might be here because you're wrestling with the idea of God. And you might be wondering in wrestling, does he really exist? How is he really? What, What is he like? You might be wrestling and saying, God, I need something from you. I need God, you to do something for me. Now, if you're in Christ, maybe you know that the Christian experience isn't this flatline, boring, monotony experience. The Christian experience is one with peaks and valleys. A God who walks with us in the valley of the shadow of death. A God who is with us on the mountaintops. When it's so good, we say, Lord, I don't want to leave here. A God who is with us in the day-to-day. But we wrestle with him. And I consider this as I saw our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. So if you're new to Amazing Love, what you need to know is a couple years ago, we took a mission journey to Ukraine, and we established relationships with people there. We established relationships with the bishop of the Ukrainian Lutheran Church. Um, His name is uh, Bishop uh, Hornpachuk. He just went by Bishop Slavic. That's what he said we could call him. Um, And uh, just an incredible man, an incredible, incredible man. Um, He he was a man who grew up in Ukraine, and the Russians took his um, many hundreds of acres farm away. Many hundreds of acres was just stolen from him, and then he was forced into the Russian military. If you look at World War II, how many Ukrainians lost their lives, it's staggering um, what they did to oppress that nation. We met him, and we learned all that was going on. We had a chance to share the gospel. There we are with Dan and Ryan and Bella. Uh, share the gospel in Kiev and Kherson and Mykolaiv, and, and we got to know just these incredible people. And, and we went with this goal of showing them love, and then they outloved us. To be kind, and then they outkinded us. To give, and then they outgave us on every level. On every level. In fact, uh, I don't know who I am as a pastor, but this guy, he's one of my favorite pastors I've ever met. This guy, he would just drive people around. He would uh, have a heart for anyone. I mean, this guy was just the grace of God in his community, helping kids, helping everyone he saw. Uh, These are the pastors. These are the people of Ukraine. I don't know who I am in the kingdom of God, but I have a ton of admiration. But now with the news, can you consider the wrestling match that they're going through? Can you imagine some of the questions that are coming up in their minds and how that would be a struggle? God, where are you? God, how is this going to work out? God, what should I do? Should I stay? Should I go? 
Should I fight? Should I be at peace? God, guide me. Like, this is not a flatline monotony. This is extreme to, to the very nth degree. And then that came up. And I don't know what you think whenever you hear of war, but I do believe we're living in the end times. Um, look at what Jesus, our Savior, said. Um, it's not here. If you can block out the back part and then put it up. Thank you. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. And, and so this is going on in the end times. It's always going to go on. And in a much lighter way than some of you know I had my own wrestling match. <laughs> not even comparable. Um, some of you might know that... Um, yeah, I, I struggled with clarity in the call, and part of it is I have family in Florida. I wish you could meet my family. I really do. They're cool. They're really good people. But then as I struggled with clarity, asking my Heavenly Father just to hold his kid by the hand, he gave it to me in spades. He gave it to me in, in a way that such peace overwhelmed me. And he reminded me of all the things that I already saw and knew. He reminded me the opportunity we have for ministry here, to reach many people with the gospel. He reminded me that Chicago ain't so bad. And baseball season is coming. And Florida's got hurricanes. Come on. He reminded me what I've already said. That in a church family, we might come and go, but if you ever think that's light in my heart, if we've had some time together, it's not. And I'll always wish you well. But it doesn't mean I won't miss you fiercely. And I'm so glad I don't have to say goodbye. <laughs> I'm so glad that for whatever season God ordains, because it's about him, we can walk together. But most of all, you know what he reminded me of? His grace and mercy. Why would he have mercy on someone like me? I don't deserve it. It's not mine by right. And yet, once again, he shows me that he's merciful and loving, that he's a forgiving God. And that's what you need to know for your own wrestling matches. And here's what I know about why he wrestles with us. It's our first takeaway. Why does he allow it to go on? Because he wants us close. Consider what a wrestling match is. When you're wrestling with someone, you can feel exactly how strong they are. You, you know exactly what they're like. You know their moves and their power, their skill, their might, even know the smell of their breath. You can't even get closer than wrestling with someone, right? And so when God invites us to wrestle over one issue or another, what he's inviting you to do is come close because that's what he wants for you. Because when everything else fades away, when this world is done, when the world is over, the only thing that will remain is are you close with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's all that's going to matter. It won't matter what house you live in. It won't matter what car you drive. All that will matter is that you know Jesus, the King of Kings. And if you've been wrestling with him, maybe that's the reason why. So that he can hold you close. And so today we're going to hear a lesson. And this is of a literal wrestling match. This is um, a man named Jacob who all night um, had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. And it lasts all night. And we're going to learn about what Jacob learned uh, from this reading. And uh, sometimes we rise, sometimes we don't. Could we rise as we just hear the, the word of God, the, the powerful words that are coming to us today? Uh, so from Genesis chapter 32 it says, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob replied, please tell me your name. 
But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it's because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. And therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. This is the powerful word of God. Feel free to be seated. A little bit more about the war. So what's very interesting is what Putin had said before, during, and, um, you know, probably after. He's, he's uh, as CNN put it, entering a war on a runway of lies. And it's interesting to hear all the lies that Putin has given. For example, I don't know what you know about the war so far, but he said, I'm sending troops over there to make peace. He called them peacemakers. He says that the Russians in that state, they, they were uh, about to commit genocide over, um, they were going to under, under genocide by the Ukrainians. And so he sent his peacemakers to again protect the Russians from genocide from the Ukrainians. He also has used the term denazification. Have you heard this? And I came across an interesting report that I wanted to share with you, and I'm not trying to get too political today. But the president of Ukraine is Jewish, has many family members who died in the Holocaust. Putin's claim that he is invading to denazify Ukraine should shock the world. I'm not trying to strong arm your beliefs on what's happening politically. I'm glad the king of kings is on the throne. But it's pretty apparent to see there are some lies going on. This is so relatable and why I brought it up is because when it comes to Jacob, He knew what it was to live his life in lies. Let me tell you a little bit about his story. Jacob was a twin brother of Esau, came out second, and um, he tried to steal the birthright. One day his brother Esau was so hungry and needed a bowl of stew that he said, I will give you this bowl of stew that I just made if you give me your birthright. Took advantage of the situation. And Esau's reaction Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? So he got it through deception. When it was time to get the birthright, he had to go to his father Isaac. And Isaac was blind and couldn't see. And and he connived with his mom. And when Esau was out trying to get something for the father to give the birthright, they did something first. And because Esau, whose name means hairy, was very hairy, The mom dressed up Jacob in young goat skins so that when the blind father came in and heard Jacob's voice but felt his neck and his arms, he thought it was Esau. And thus he stole the birthright. This actually led to Esau wanting to kill him, and so he had to run from his house because of his lies. The lies continued as he was at Laban's house, and, and the way he got money, the way he increased his wealth, is through conniving. Jacob, I don't know how many Jacobs are here today, I apologize, because uh, he is a man of God, by the way. But Jacob's name means deceiver. Jacob's name means heel grabber. And as we look at him, we see a story about an opportunity for a man to trust either in his own might, his own power, his own conniving, or to trust the Lord. And as we look at this and we try to apply and say, God, what are you showing me? He's saying there's two ways really to live life. You can either trust in yourself, your power, your wisdom, your beauty, your money, your strategy, everything that you are doing, or you can trust in him and how good it is to trust in him. And so our takeaway, God allows us to wrestle with him to win our trust, to win our trust. And you consider all the times that that happens. We were having a a, a dating 101, and it was funny, not a single guy was there. That that probably uh, shows you how dating 101 uh, the first time went. (laughs) And, uh, and it was so interesting. We were talking in a light way about the gift of sex. 
And, um, and, and all in help, all trying to, like, you know, be appropriate in telling that God created this wonderful gift, right? Um, but, but also because here's what we know. Our young kids are going to go out on dates, like if you're an old person, you did, and they're going to wrestle. And they're going to wrestle with emotions and feelings that are pretty strong when you're romantically inclined, pretty strong when you're a young person. And they're going to be on the razor's edge of, do I trust what God says or do I trust what I'm feeling? Do I trust God's path or do I trust where he, where, where, where I want to go in that moment? And as you know, as you grow up, there's opportunities to be tested in this all the time. You can go to a job and you know what you can do to cut corners. You know what you can do to get more money even though it's not the right way to get money. Even though it's not the right way to win the thing. Even though it's not the right way to go about it. You know. Or you can trust God. When it comes to kids, I think he often tests our hearts on kids. We can either trust that God has them and God's got them, or we can trust that because I'm the perfect parent, it's all going to work out. Because I'm always going to be there, and I'm always going to say and do the right thing, and I'm always going to have the right answer. And so God invites us to trust. But maybe as I even bring up these topics... And I could go on and on about trusting God with money, trusting God in every relationship, trusting God in so many areas. I could go on and on. Perhaps you realize with me how often we fail. God allows us to do a trust fall and we fail. And what I love about God is that his mercy, his love, his blessing is not contingent on your perfect performance and your perfect trust. If God's blessing was contingent on your perfect performance, you and I would have no blessing. And I saw that through Jacob's life. A little bit more about Jacob. Even though he connived for the blessing, the Son of God still came from his family line. Even though he had to flee from his house, he became very wealthy at Laban's household. God blessed him along the way and why? So that Jacob could come up and say, look at me, I'm the example of trust. No. So that Jacob could say, look at me, I'm an example of God's mercy. Of a God who does more for me than I could ever do for him. And so the great reality is this. God blesses us, not because of our perfect trust, but because of his perfect love. How awesome is that? And now you might be saying, well, let's not trust God and let's do whatever we want. But that's not what the Spirit says, does it really? Does the Spirit hear that and say, now I want to do whatever I want? No. And, and why can he treat us this way? It's because of Jesus. It's because of the, the person that we talk about, the, the Savior of the world. God's blessing is contingent on his perfect performance and not ours. God's blessing is not about an unwavering faith, but an unwavering God. God's salvation is not up to us, but has always been up to him as a gift of his grace. And so we can have peace and confidence that we have a God who not only has amazing love, but amazing mercy. A God who blesses those who could never be perfect. And how wonderful that is. He's the God who invites prodigals home. He's the God who invites the broken to be healed. This is the God that we've come to celebrate. But what would it look like? What would it be like if you and I continued to trust? If you and I continued to, to gain in what it is to believe that God is there? I think I have a picture of what it might look like. So some of you might have seen these Christians, uh, this is in Kharkiv, I don't know how to pronounce that exactly. When the war was breaking out and what did the Christians do? They come into the, the circle, the, the square of the city and they start praying. And there are incredible stories of trust during the war. In fact, uh, some of the pastors are choosing to stay because they know what the people need. They know what the people need. And one pastor put it this way, 
When this is over, the citizens of Kiev will remember how Christians have responded in their time of need. He wrote for the Gospel Coalition, We will shelter the weak, serve the suffering, and mend the broken. And as we do, we offer the unshakable hope of Christ and his gospel. What incredible faith to be there for the people. And Jacob, who had failed time and time and time again, in this account, he shows us a great thing to do in the wrestling match. In this account, he shows us um, our, our strategy. It says, when the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched, and as he wrestled with God and man. What we understand there is that Jacob saw firsthand he's wrestling with someone he is not able to beat. He's wrestling with someone that he has to just submit to. And that's our next takeaway. One of the reasons we wrestle with God is so that we end up submitting to him. To saying, God, finally, ultimately, in this category, I'm sick of me, and I just want you. I'm sick of me, and I just want your grace and your blessing. And so I wonder, what is that category for you that God is inviting you to submit to? Is it a relationship that's in your life? As we just talked about imperfect family. To do what you can in a difficult situation, but to follow God to the degree that you can. Is it in the area of finances? And God has blessed you. There is stimulus money. Now there's taxes. But you're wondering with the increase, what should I do? Should I finally go out and give first fruits? Should, should, I, should I trust him with more? What should I do? For me, you know what it is, once again? It's a recommitment for me of whose church this is. And I submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And I'm so excited to serve him. But all the results, all the blessing, everything that happens next on this journey, with people that I love to work with, is in whose control? Our God's control. And to the degree I get in the way of that, to the degree we get in the way of that, we do not give him glory. And so I submit everything to the Lord, for it is his. What about you? And Jacob teaches us that strategy, to submit to the Lord in all things, to trust in him. But then he also does something pretty phenomenal. Did you, did you recognize this part? So I'm going to share uh, what he did next. Um, he said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So what is Jacob doing? This? He's already lost. He has to submit. But he's doing some bold action here. He's saying, I know I'm nothing. I know I don't have it all together. I know you can touch me and it's over. But here's the deal. Out of boldness, you got to bless me. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what I imagine? I imagine, do you remember being a kid and grabbing the leg of your father or your mother or a bigger sibling? And you hold on to that leg and what do they do? <laughs> And there I see Jacob, right? And Jacob's like, I'm not letting go. You got to bless me, right? And the guy's like, oh, all right. And it's interesting. There's another account that kind of talks about this. It's interesting that Jesus, he had this interaction with a Canaanite woman that was very, very similar. So in this story, a Canaanite woman, a non-Jew, came to Jesus and said, my, my child is demon-possessed. And Jesus, I need you to take the demon out of her. And then Jesus says something very, very strange. And it strikes us almost as like careless. It strikes us almost like, why would you ever say that? Uh, he says this, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to dogs. Can you imagine if someone came to Amazing Love and said, Pastor, I really want to talk to you and know Jesus Christ. And I'm like, it's not right to take bread and toss it to dogs. Who are you? That'd be crazy. That's, by the way, not our response. So what, <laughs> what is Jesus trying to do here? Jesus is trying to encourage her not to give up. Jesus is trying to encourage her to grab on, to not let go, to persist. And so she does. 
And the beautiful response she has, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, and she wouldn't give up. And then Jesus said, whoa, that's amazing faith. Whoa, you trust me, don't you? And the child was healed. What is Jacob doing? He's saying, you got to bless me. And I'm not letting go because I know who you are, God. I know that you're on my side, even when it feels like you're on my side. I know that you speak to me, even when it feels silent. I know you're good, even when I feel bad. I know you're light, even when the world is dark. I know who you are, God. And so I'm not letting go. And Jacob teaches us in our wrestling. He wants us to cling to God and ask for his blessing. And that's the opportunity of the Ukrainians right now to know that even if they die, they will live. No matter what happens in their heart, God is going to be there. He's never going to leave them and never going to forsake them. And you and I will have our own storms every day. And the opportunity of every day is to say, but God, you said there is immeasurably more than I can ask or imagine with you. God, you said you're going to work all things for my good. God, you said you have eternity prepared in store for me. God, you are good and you're with me. And he's glorified when we hang on to those promises. Glorified when we hold on. And so Jacob did. And God blessed him. And Jacob was given a new name, and I'm not sure you need a new name if your name is Jacob, by the way. It's still a good name. He's a man of God. But Jacob was given the name Israel. And God, who's very intentional with every word, with every action that he does, changed Jacob's name from the deceiver, someone who connives and trusts in himself, to Israel. Do you know what Israel means? means the Lord fights. What he was trying to show to Jacob, what he's trying to show to us in every season, is that whatever you've been trying to do on your own power, whatever you thought was all up to you, whatever you put too much pressure on, the Lord is inviting you today and saying, let me fight your battle. Let me take this one. For I will be with you and I will be your God. And so that's our next step for today. Our next step is whatever you're tempted to do from your own strength, to submit to God and let him fight for you. Let him take you by the hand. Mind you that you're a kid, but you got a really good father. And just cling to him and wait for his blessing. Through the power of God, may he give you strength to do so. Now let me pray for you. And so, Almighty, merciful Father, we are unworthy of any blessing you may give us. But today we are before you like kids in submission, saying, Father, have your way. As long as we can have you, have your way. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you um, for this community. Thank you for all your blessings and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.